Hi, welcome everybody to CenterSat Unscripted. I am Dan Bauer and this is my sidekick, Patrick Curran. Hi. And I already got a pen. I'm reserving the, this pen. I like it. Because I, I can I have get one too. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, at the risk of getting uh, derailed very early. Boy, that on. took, even for us, yeah. that was pretty quick. So today, our topic is multi-level modeling for intensive longitudinal data. And um, we're going to start out by just kind of talking about what is intensive longitudinal data, why is it so cool, and then we're going to see, ooh, there are a whole lot of analytic issues that come up with intensive longitudinal data. Fortunately, multi-level modeling is really well suited to handle a lot of those. And so we're going to kind of see what multi-level models can offer us, and then we'll say, well, what are some things maybe it doesn't offer us and some additional directions that we could consider for analyzing ILD. And while the little place screen was holding, uh, uh, spinning around as we waited, we actually, we got really organized this time. This and we actually, this is pretty good for us. A couple of things just to remind you is um, we've got some free 75 minute lectures on our webpage on ILD. And so Jean-Philippe Laurenceau from University of Delaware has a really nice presentation on general issues in ILD. And then if you are a glutton for punishment, Dan and I did three. Yep. We did three separate ones, and uh, one is general issues, one is on multi-level modeling, and one is on dynamic structural equation modeling. Yeah. They're completely free. They were part of the American Psychological Association, so we thank them for their generosity. But you can just go to centerstat.org, and I think the, a tab is like free stuff or something, yeah, and go like there. It's like a resources, free yeah, resources. Yeah, free resources, stuff. and there's a ton of stuff there, and that's one of them. Um, also, we are incredibly fortunate where Jean-Philippe Laurenceau and Niall Bolger, who are two of the world's leaders in ILD and design execution and analysis, they actually teach a class with us at Centerstat, and it's on my thing. I, I'm very proud. I'm just very proud of it's myself that I May looked it up. June. It's this spring. But uh, June 12th through the 16th, they teach a five-day class in how do you gather data, how do you do measurement, how do you analyze it, very much from a substantive standpoint. So that is super helpful. And then Dan and I probably have a less helpful class because you and I teach it together. But we have a general multi-level modeling, and that's in the third week of May. Um, and so I'm really proud of myself. I can now wad that up and throw it at you. Um, and then two other things while we have you getting into it is because Dan and I are fundamentally lazy. We are taking next week off because it is spring break here at Carolina and we don't yep. feel like driving into campus. Um, and so there won't be an episode next week. And then the following week, it's probably your fault, I'm sure. But instead of being on Thursday, we're going to have a one-time move to Tuesday, which will be the 21st. And we're going to talk about type 1, type 2 error and power. At least it'll be a one-time move until we decide we have to move it again for some other reason. <laughs> but this time I think it's your fault. I think you're out of town. I am actually out of town. I get, I'm excited as I get to go and visit the Department of Psychology at the University of Minnesota, which I love that place. I love that town. The people there are great. Um, one of my favorite people is there, Niels Waller, who Ooh. is a quant. They have a... They have decades, decades, decades long history in psychometrics measurement. So that'll be fun. That's where I am. Yeah, but we're bleeding time, Kern. Let's get into you know that's my middle. Do you know that's my middle name? Is it bleeding time? Bleeding Kern. time, Kern. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It sounds cooler in Gaelic, but I thought it's, it was Taco Story. It's Kern. Taco Story. It depends what day. Today's Wednesday, so it's bleeding time. All right. So what we're going to do today is talk about intensive longitudinal data. What is it? Um, how do we go about getting it? And more importantly, once you have it, what the heck do you do with it? And we can think about every time, every time, you're just, you're, you're just crowding my space. All right? You're very we can, kind of, we can think about density of repeated measures on a continuum. All right. So where we start is with kind of traditional, what is often called panel data. All right. So for a lot of you older folks like me, this is kind of what we were born and raised with, which is you go out in the field and you gather 
a large number of measures on a large sample at a given point in time. And that's often wave one. And then maybe 12 months later, you do it again at wave two and wave three and wave four. Maybe you have three repeated measures, maybe four, major, maybe five. But the reason it's called panel is it literally, we think about the design in panels of panel one, panel two, panel three. A lot of the big public access data sets are organized around this. NLSY, the, uh, any of those big ones, the Eccles, LSA, they're all taken at 12 month or 24 month. All right, and this is really important and, and a lot of really good work has been done with that. At the other end of the continuum is what is sometimes called time series. All right, and this is almost the opposite of panel. So where panel is a large number of people with a smaller number of repeated measures, time series in old school, like traditional, is one observation taken a very high number of repeated measures. And a classic one there is if you're studying the stock market and you might have an index, the S&P 100 index or the Dow Jones index. And you might have the Dow Jones index, which is your only measure, right, of the New York Stock Exchange, but you have the closing price every day for a year. All right, so that's time series. Now, there are ways that they have, they have kind of a meta-analysis time series where you can have multiple observations, but it's typically a very small number of observations um, taken over a very high number of repeated measures. But what about the blob? I like my blobs. What about the blob in here? Right, is what if you fall where you don't have a huge sample size, but maybe you have a moderate sample size. And you don't have a huge number of repeated measures, but you have a moderate number of repeated measures. And that blob is where ILD falls. I'm seeing another caption contest in the future. <laughs> Just, we'll get there. We'll get there. Right, we'll start. Oh boy. Look. It's like an amoeba. It's, I thought it was a piece of toast, but... Oh, that, there we go. So there's our ILD blob, all right? And what this is, is maybe I'm just making up numbers. There are no fixed uh, uh, cutoffs here, but you know, sample size might be, you know, 50 to 100, right? So a good size sample, but not three or four or 500. And time periods might be 10 or 20 or 30 or 50, I'll just say 10 to 30 but not like 300, all right? So this is where we're falling in between and that's the ILD, intensive longitudinal data. So why would we want something like that? Well, in my neck of the woods, one thing I study is looking at risk and protective factors for adolescent substance use. And one that is a really interesting, here we go, we start getting high right off the bat, mm -hmm. is, um, is that there's a real interest in trying to link together negative affects, so say anxiety and depression, and alcohol use. And there's a hypothesis that adolescents drink alcohol, the term is self-medication. That is, they feel bad, they have negative feelings, and they drink in response to that. Well, when I came up through the system, back before horses were invented, is we assess depression at age 12 and predicted alcohol use at age 13. And then we took alcohol use at age 13 and predicted depression at age 14. Well, that's light years from where the theory is. The theory is, is I feel bad during the day, and so I drink that night. And when you take it in panel data over long ranges of time, the literature is just a train wreck of some positive effects, some negative effects, some null effects. Well, you can argue you completely miss the time window to capture that kind of relation. Morning to night, morning to night, morning to night. Maybe you do a diary study, you do 50 kids for 14 days, and now you're in that middle ground of ILD. All right, now very briefly, we had a prior episode on latent curve model, all right? And what we talked about was we would make a manifest variable for each repeated measure. So this was time one and time two and time three and time four, 
All right? And what we talked about is you need to have enough people that were assessed at each time point to support a variable in your model. You need a mean, you need a variance, you need a covariance. And if this is age 6 and 7 and 8 and 9, well, you're pretty cool. You're fine. You're, we can have missing data, we can have unequally spaced data. But more or less, we might have 30 or 40 people assessed at each time point. Well, what if you're collecting data on your iPhone and you ping randomly once in the morning, once in the afternoon, and once in the evening? Well, it may be that there are no two subjects who have the same time measure. I might be 9.58, Dan is 10.45, you're 11.55, and pretty quickly, I mean like really quickly, the latent curve model breaks down. And we're not able to use this in the traditional way. There's a workaround that are called definition variables, but functionally that's a multi-level model anyway. That We could talk about that in another episode. So the, L, the latent curve model rapidly breaks down in the presence of intensive longitudinal data. But remember the multi-level model, we had outcome YTI, which is time within person, and we had some intercept beta naught sub i and some slope beta 1 sub i times time t sub i, plus our trusty little residual. Well, time is just a predictor in the model. It doesn't care if anybody shares that value. It doesn't care if it's balanced. It doesn't care if it's equally spaced. Every single person in the sample can have a different numerical value of time and MLM shrugs and takes a drag off its cigarette and flicks it. I always think, I've never smoked, but that just seems cool. You flick your cigarette and it doesn't care. But here's the trick, is everybody tells you to go get intensive longitudinal data and you go put in blood, sweat, and tears and brings it back. And then the same person who told you to go get it says, yeah, I, I don't know what to do with that. Sorry, I got to go for a run and they leave. So what we need to do is think about, all right, we're motivated to go get this, but what the heck do we then do with it? So we'll come back to this equation, but we got... That was a perfectly good equation. Why did... Yeah, I mean, you got that one right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, even a blind pig finds a truffle, right? I like that one. I like that one. <laughs> I had a neighbor who used to say even a blind squirrel finds a nut every now and then, and it was okay because he was himself blind, so it's all right to say it. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to see there are a lot of complexities associated with intensive longitudinal data that we need to take into account. So one, as Patrick already mentioned, is we have lots of observations, and those observations might not all be on a fixed time schedule. We could do some kind of random time intervals that we assess people at. Different people could be on completely different schedules. So we got lots and lots of repeated measures. That's one issue we've got to contend with. Another issue we're going to contend with is that there's both between person differences on our outcomes of interest, right? Some people are going to be higher, some people are going to be lower on average across the repeated measures. But there's also going to be within person differences. And we really need to parse those in order to maximize our ability to analyze ILD. Right, so I'm going to use kind of a silly example, which is heart rate, right? So we're going to look at heart rate. So imagine we're getting ambulatory heart rate readings over the course of a day for a number of participants. Maybe it's with something like an Apple Watch, maybe it's a Fitbit, whatever it might be. We're just getting these samplings. Can you not do that right now? It's like you're opening a bag of chips, right? It's a crinkle, crinkle. I'm bored. All right. I'm so bored. Right, Patrick. Go run laps, go run laps. <laughs> no, I don't want to raise my heart rate. Exactly. All right, so we've got, we've got time, right, on our x-axis, and we've got heart rate on our y-axis, and we've got different people that we're looking at. And so Patrick is a runner, right? So Patrick, what's your resting heart rate? Maybe 60? 58. 58, all right. So Patrick's resting heart rate is 58. So we would say he's, he's going to be somewhere around here, right? But at any given moment, he might be higher or lower. Right, so right now he's sitting down, so maybe it's a little lower than is his typical resting. Right, stands up, maybe it goes up a little bit, right? We're gonna see these observations kind of bounce around the line over time. So there's both, there's, there's that within person variability that we're seeing for Patrick. Now I also run, but I run very slowly. So my resting heart rate, we're gonna say is maybe 64. So it's a little higher than Patrick's. And so this is my 
average level that we see over time. And then if we look at my observations, similarly, there's going to be some scatter around that line. Some observations are going to be lower, other observations are going to be higher, right? But and we've you got lift weights and, and I don't. And I can barely pick up my cup of coffee. Occasionally, yeah. And I haven't blown out my other shoulder yet. So. <laughs> um, so we've got lots of these observations, right? There could be hundreds of these observations and they could be very densely packed in time. It might be like every five minutes. It could be every 10 minutes. It could be every 15 minutes. It could be in random intervals where no two people are observed at the same occasions. And as Patrick nicely talked about for a change, um, we've got a variable time in our model, we simply represent that, that time point. Now right here, the way I've drawn it, there are no time trends yet. So we're gonna keep things nice and simple. And we're gonna say, how can we represent both the between person differences we see in those average heart rates versus the within person differences that we see around that? Well, the multi-level model is really nicely suited to that because we can just have a model where we say heart rate is equal to some average value for the person. So I'll use the TI like Patrick had. So we'll have some intercept that represents the average value for the person, beta naught, and then some deviation at that particular time point. Did you use R or E? E. Okay. okay, we'll go with E just to keep things consistent. All right, so we've got some, we'll call it error, some residual, right, bouncing around, but each person gets their own beta knot, right? So Patrick's beta knot is gonna be at, I'm gonna say beta knot Patrick is gonna be at like 58, right? His resting heart rate and mine is gonna be at 64, right? So my beta knot is gonna be up there, right? So we've got those between person differences represented through that random intercept in the model, and then we've got the variation around. Right, so we've got between person variability and within person variability. Now, one thing that in the traditional multi-level model we typically assume is that those errors are independent and identically distributed, right? So usually we assume that there's one error variance that holds for every, every one of these residuals and that the residuals are independent of one another. That is typically not gonna be the case in ILD because the observations are so close together in time, right? Patrick, I don't know, hold up your Tim Horton cup, Patrick. Oh. Patrick just got a cup of coffee. I did. Right? <laughs> so Patrick's heart rate, the caffeine is kicking his heart rate up a little bit, right? So maybe this is, maybe this is the observation we've got right now. Here, here. Well, he's not done with his coffee. He's going to keep I drinking it. I and, almost do. And, okay, he almost did. <laughs> but nevertheless, caffeine has a half-life, right? So his heart rate's probably still going to be yeah. elevated at the next and then at some point that caffeine is going to wear off and his heart rate's going to go back down and it's going to stay down until his next cup of coffee, right? And so very often with intensive longitudinal data, we'll see this pattern where a positive residual tends to be followed by another positive residual. A negative residual tends to be followed by another negative residual. And the fancy name for that is we have a pattern of serial correlation. Now right. the reason, if I may, just as we throw lifelines back to the panel data, is let's say that you measured my coffee intake at age 56 and my heart rate at age 57. Well, the term is decay, is any relation that is captured here is long gone yeah. by the time you get that next measure. And so in the LCM, pfft, we don't even think about this stuff because that level of serial correlation has decayed to zero. Yeah, the, the effect of the coffee he had three days ago on his heart right now is gone, right? It's, it's decayed to nothing. And so typically with an intensive longitudinal data application, we can't make that default assumption and we need some kind of serial error structure. So as an example, it's very common to assume an autoregressive structure where there's some autoregressive parameter, we'll call it rho, and then that gets powered to the difference in time, right? So we'll say time two minus time one is the difference between those two time points. And that will tell us for one interval in time how highly correlated are those two residuals, right? That absolute difference in time powers that autoregression, right? Now see what's gonna happen here is as that gets bigger, right? It's gonna make this autoregression smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Let's say this is like 0.7. Right? Well, if there's a one unit difference in time, the correlation is 0.7. 
If there's a two unit difference in time, it's 0.7 squared. So now it's down to 0.49. If there's a three unit difference in time, what's, what's 0.7? I was going to ask you. What is it? What is it? 0.28 something? It's in change, yeah. OK. We'll go with We'll that. go with 0.29. We'll put the change in there, right? So it's getting smaller and smaller as time goes by. Well, that might be 15 minutes. That might be 30 minutes. That might be 45 minutes. The more time that's going by, the more decay you get. That is a first order autoregressive structure. It's very commonly used with ILD, but it's not the only one. There are lots of different kinds of decay structures we can put on those uh, correlations. All right, so one issue was we have lots of repeated measures, not necessarily at the same time points for everybody. We've talked about how we can handle that. Another issue is we've got these serially correlated residuals. We've talked about, okay, we've got these serial correlation structures that we can put in the model. Another issue is within and between person variation in our measures. Now, what we haven't yet talked about is we want to predict that, right? So there are reasons why those values are higher and these values are lower, and we want to be able to predict the within person variation as well as the between person variation. And the multi-level model, again, is really well suited to that, is to look at that between person variation we're going to say, OK, I could just have an equation for beta naught i where I'm going to put some predictors into that equation. That's going to capture these differences in intercepts, what gives rise to those. And then if I want to look at variation within person over time, that's going to go into my level one model here. Right? So let's just take as a sort of a silly example exercise. All right? so, Heart rate's going to go up as someone's exercising, and it's going to go down when someone's not exercising. At the same time, people who exercise more on average are going to tend to have lower resting heart rates, right? So we have both within and between person effects. All right, so to get at that within person effect, we're going to add a beta 1 here for exercise, right? We're still going to have our residual, but we're going to add in, are you exercising at that time point or not, right? That's going to be a variable that we're going to add in. And then at level two, right, we're going to have an effect of your average exercise, right? So sort of a person mean for how much you exercise. And that's going to explain some of those between person differences. Can I insert a really complicated statistical concept? Yes. The between person is pushing the whole line up or pulling the line down, right? Is that's that between prediction of how yeah. high is that so line. This one versus that one. Is a push and a pull, all right? The within person is a doink. All right? Is what you're doing is you're going, were you exercising at this time? Doink. And does that push up one of those squares or, I don't know what the hell those are, little sixes or something? I don't know. They're squiggles. But, of squiggles. But so you have a push-pull for the between, but you have a doink for the within that are jointly at the same time so this, trying to capture these relations. So if I'm exercising at these time points, right, that's the doink. Doink, right? doink, doink. It's doinking that up and then eventually my heart rate's going to return to resting level, right? Um, one other little point here is that when we enter a predictor at level one that we want to have represent the within person effect, we are usually going to person mean center that predictor, mm. right? So that it only contains within person variation in it. So we're predicting within person variation in heart rate from within person variation in exercise. We're predicting between person differences in heart rate from those person means, those between person differences in average exercise. All right, so we can parse the effects of our predictors into these within and between person components. And often we're really interested in that within effect. All right, so Patrick gave an example of negative affect and alcohol use. On days that you have higher negative affect, do you drink more that night? Um, actually, I think a recent meta-analysis came out where it's positive affect that seems to have the bigger effect. And so maybe there are moderators uh, that uh, live out in the world. Uh, there be dragons. I mm. know, I know. Yep. All right, so then one last complication I want to get into is so far, we've drawn this with no time trends. 
Uh -huh. right? It's just a steady state, and we're just fluctuating around that steady state. But often with ILD, you will see complicated time trends. You may even see transition shifts. And so one thing that happens with heart rate, let's say we kept measuring heart rate, not just during the day, but also at night. This is an, an example we use in our multi-level modeling. <laughs> Do you want me to I open can't that open for the... you? There it is. <laughs> His heart rate just went up. It did. And I do occasionally <laughs> lift weights, so this is really sad. Apparently, I need more finger strength. Um, do they make finger weights? Can you? Sure. You lift this. The You're burning time, Bauer. All right. So in the example that we use in our multiple modeling class, there's a transition point where people go to sleep. And there's a strong interest in do you see a dip in heart rate during that nighttime period, which <laughs> is supposed to represent sort of a restorative period, right? So your heart, stop it, stop it, stop it. All right, it's supposed to represent a restorative <laughs> period where your heart rate goes down. All right, well, we can do this too, right? So we can build a model where heart rate at time T for person I, you know, again, we're gonna have some intercept. Now we're gonna have some slope for time during the day and we're gonna have another slope for time at night, and that's gonna allow for this sort of shift in the trend that we're observing. So we could have one trend during the day. Here we've drawn them to be flat, but maybe they go up, maybe they go down, and then we see a transition point when people go to sleep, and there's a change. And these kinds of piecewise models are really nice with ILD, particularly when you're anticipating some kind of transition point. Um, could be because you're doing like pre-intervention repeated measures and post-intervention repeated measures. Those are really cool designs. Um, but we can, you know, we can accommodate a lot of complexity in the sorts of trends that we observe over time. Can I add one quick thing? Yeah. That's really cool is in this, we can then have the pre-slope, so slope one, which here is flat, but it's still slope. Post-slope, which is slope two, but we could code time where this is our intercept and we could predict between person differences in their resting heart rate when they go to sleep. It is really neat. It is really cool. And I'll leave you with one other thing, right? So earlier I said we could look at that effect of exercise, that within person effect. The other thing we haven't talked about is you can have these within person effects differ across people, right? So. If you're like an uber athlete that runs all the time, your heart rate's gonna go up when you run, but maybe not as much as the weekend warrior who's like out there for the first time and their heart rate is just like laboring their way down the trail, right? So we could allow for differential magnitude of effects for those within person predictors. And that to me is one of the coolest things of intensive longitudinal data. Right? We have decades and decades and decades of psychological research where we assume that this variable affects that variable with this weight, and the weight is the same for everybody. The effect is the exact same for everybody. And with intensive longitudinal data, because we have so many time points per person, we can determine whether or not the effects of those predictors really are the same for everyone. So if my positive affect is elevated, I do drink more that night. If Patrick's positive affect is elevated, he doesn't. Right? They're different effects. It's not, it doesn't have to be the same for everybody. And we could build in then predictors of why is it different for Patrick than it is for me. Right? Mostly my positive affect comes so rarely I have to celebrate it. Well, it comes regularly, just nobody can tell. Nobody noticed. Yeah. <laughs> He's like the most flat affect expression person ah, yeah. I have ever. It's no, it's not that you don't experience, it's just nobody freaking knows. Um, okay, so a couple Wait, you of can't points. Tell I'm happy right now. <laughs> um, a uh, a couple of points to make clear before we wrap up here is everything Dan has talked about can be fully incorporated into the multi-level model. This is not any weirdo wacko stuff that you got to go do, you know, with with wind bugs or something. Is these are. Pretty straightforward. Again, JP and Niall talk about this. We have these online things. We talk about uh, uh, core stuff in our multi-level uh, modeling workshop. These are very straightforward to do, and they can be done in any software package. 
So you don't need specialized software. You don't need to go out and buy something brand new. Is these are just again, you know, MLM is is flicking its cigarette and says, yeah, let's get to work. I can do this. Now, before we try to sell you and give you a free set of steak knives while you're at it, of course, there are limitations to this. There that you might need to then turn to other kinds of strategy. One thing that this is really well suited for, because it's in its natural environment, is we've been talking about time nested within individual and everyone, you know, all the, the interpretations that Dan has been giving. This model would again light another cigarette, it's really having problems at this point, flick that one and say, yeah, I can go to three levels. You can have time nested within individual and individual nested within classroom or treatment group or anything that you like in a hierarchical way. It's very well suited to do that. What it's less well suited is pulling in more than one dependent variable. Now, what that means is, is Dan has been talking about heart rate. He drew HR sub TI equals and then all of the cool stuff we did on the right hand side of the equal sign where on the left hand side there sat heart rate. Now, there's a way of tricking uh, the multi-level model into having a bivariate outcome. Uh, I've actually written a couple of papers on that, of which I have joint like three citations on, so you can see how widely used, either how widely used it is or how poorly I write papers. Was that you, those are, your mom, and your brother? <laughs> those so. are alternative hypotheses. Is maybe I just write bad papers. But if you're a multi-level modeler and saying, oh no, that's crap, you can do bivariate, you can, but not in the way that we're talking about here. You can build one model for one outcome, one model for another, and then correlate them at the trajectories, but you can't tie together the time-specific measures. So let's go back to my very opening example of the depression and the alcohol use is Instead of just looking at heart rate and predictors of heart rate, what if our density, high density measures were, we have the time on both axes, but we have two outcomes now. All right, so we have depression that kids are filling out on their cell phone. We have ALK use in the evening where they're saying in the, 20, in the prior 24 hours, how many drinks did you consume, whatever that item might be. Right? And I won't put in a, uh, a time trend, but we could, is let's say that for me, again, I have some depression, up, down, up, down, up, down, and then I'm going to do yours and change colors. And for you, you alk use... You got the cap off so easy. I know. I pre-uncapped pre it, actually, oh, is God. up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. All right, so notice we now have two of these processes. And what I really want to know is if I were higher on depression at, say, time two, was I higher on alcohol use at, say, time three? And maybe if I had elevated alcohol use at time three, did that predict my relative depression at time four? All right, do you see how we're linking these deviations? And this is very much a within person question, is that if I'm more depressed than I usually am, right, that's that elevated, do I drink more than I usually do? And then if I have, like think about if either yourself or friends that you hang out with, if you drink more than you usually do the night before, does that elevate your relative depression the following day? And then picture this, but we have one of these pairs of plots for maybe 50 people. So again, we have the between, we have the within. The MLM can't model these kinds of relations. It's, it's highly limited. You can kind of bolt to Frankenstein's monster together where you look at one end and you look at the other end and you put tables side by side. We don't recommend doing that because they're not estimated simultaneously. There are a lot of limitations to doing that. It's not horrible, but it's not ideal either. The LCM, the latent curve model, is ideally suited for this, but only up to about 10 time points and then it breaks down. 
And what's really neat is that brings us to the dynamic structural equation model, or DSEM. All right, and we should do, oh wait, we did do a, one of the whole episodes. Yeah, it turns out I have no, it's not even age. When I was like 10 years old, I couldn't remember stuff is the third installment that Dan and I did in that APA series was 75 minutes on the DSIM. So um, some very important contributors have been uh, Tiamir Asparohov and Mutain, Ellen Hamacher at Utrecht University, Dan McNeish and Ellen have a wonderful paper in Psych Methods that walk through this. We'll put these sites in the show notes. But what this is, is it is quite literally a hybrid of time series multi-level and SEM. That's how they describe it, is it's building another ice cream sandwich, right? All of statistics is an ice cream sandwich. There are cookies over here, there's ice cream over here, and Dan's five-year-old son says, oh, I want them together at the same time, and bam, you have the ice cream sandwich. Well, we've got time series, we got panel data in the SEM, We've got the MLM and all that it does, and the DSEM bolts them together in a way that we can look at between subject effects, we can look at within subject effects, we can have random variables. Well, Dan, where Dan was noting earlier, that maybe there's person-to-person -person variability literally in the magnitude of the within-person effect, the doink part of the model is that drinking is just more deleterious for some people than others, right? Is that any of you have been out in the world long enough as you know that there are people who can handle their alcohol and people who can't. And maybe there's individual variability. Well, the DSEM allows for that. Now, you don't get something for nothing and you got to pay the reaper is these are wildly complicated to estimate and it takes us to a Bayesian setting, which is perfectly fine, but that layers on a whole new set of complexities. And if you're young out there and are thinking about something to research, if you're looking for a quantitative project, if you want to do a compare and contrast, there are a lot of next step projects that could be done to study the DSEM and find out under what conditions does that work really well and under what conditions does it not. Just don't give away your student's dissertation. Just, yeah. So. And some of, in the DSEM, another cool thing with that is the potential for these variables to be latent variables, right? Multiple the potential. Yeah, it, it's, they're already pretty dang complicated <laughs> models, is, so adding in a measurement model on top of that is... As uh, my mom would say, is there's, you can't draw blood from a turnip, and so yeah. you totally can. You could have a multiple indicator latent factor for depression, but again, it's just, it's that much more complexity. And that's another really good example of um, where some novel research could be done because mm -hmm. that's a wildly positive feature to have, but we haven't talked about it really in any of these things yet, but we make very strong assumptions about that multiple indicator latent factor being similar in structure over time mm -hmm. so that we're capturing the same underlying construct that, and not just change in the measurement of that over time. And we have to impose that on the data without testing it. And it's just an added complication. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so it's neat. I mean, this stuff is ready for prime time. Is this isn't, again, that you need to download some weirdo package that a monkey with a grease pencil wrote and it hasn't been tested and it only works once when you run it. This is kind of old school stuff, is you can do this with real data and existing methods right now. What do you got, any? I'm thinking maybe we should go into the chat. Okay. Um, so we got some questions about sample size and power, type one errors, uh, type two errors, which is sort of what our next topic is going to be. It is, but with respect to this, errors. my response to that is la 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 la. I can't hear you. La yeah. la la. Um, 
how the heck do you do power in these models? I mean, there's a way of doing it and, and it mostly involves Monte Carlo simulation of power. It would be exceedingly challenging mm -hmm. to uh, compute analytic power, derived power from say non-central distributions or yeah. something like that. Um, but it could be done. And, and we can say a few things about what is gonna lead to power. Oh right? yeah, so, there's general principles. You know, the more, so if we're thinking about in, intensive longitudinal data with repeated observations within persons, the more people you have is gonna, each new person is gonna give you the maximum benefit in power you can get. Adding observations per person is also gonna give you power, but not as much because those observations are not independent, right? And so they're not, each new observation is not an entirely unique piece of information. It's related to the observations you already have for that person. So that'll increase your power, but not as much. And your power will go down as that dependence goes up, right? So the higher the dependence is, the less unique information any new observation provides. So there's a definite trade-off between recruiting more people, which is typically more expensive, versus having more time points, which is typically cheaper, but doesn't give you as much bang for the buck in terms of power. Um, so those are a few things that are gonna factor into power. And then one thing that, that people often kind of forget is that if you have any measurement error, yeah. that always just goes into the noise yeah. term, right? right? It's just, it's gonna go into the residuals. It's something you can never explain your effect sizes tend to be underestimated as a function of the amount of measurement error and your power is gonna go down. So if you do a good job of developing the measures you're gonna use in the intensive longitudinal data analysis, that can do as much for you in the way of power as just adding more people might. Um, and that gets into some really interesting stuff and actually Niall and JP talk about this a little bit in their class is that we can't just take surveys that were developed to assess between person differences over long periods of time and assume they're gonna hold in an intensive longitudinal data context, right? right? So we might have a, a positive negative affect inventory that's based on the last month or the last year. Well, does that capture variation from day to day in the same way? And we might need briefer instruments. And so measurement development in an ILD context is a really important uh, topic as well. And the kind of drunken poke in the eye on top of that is you have a cell phone and it dings and a lot of times there are five feelings and there's a yes, no as to whether you're experiencing it right now. And so at my 958, I say yes, yes, no, yes, no, submit. And that's our measure for that time point. And McNeish also has a paper on measurement in ILD. And this is a very active, this is a very active area of research and very exciting. Um, and the other one, and this one I love, I forget the year it was, help me out, maybe 1987, but Golub and Reichert. So Chip mm -hmm. Reichert, um, who's at University of Denver, Dan and I know him from way back in the day. But Golub and Reichert back in, I think the 80s, wrote a really nice paper that was before growth modeling, that was before ILD, but it talked about getting the time assessment right, the time window right, in studying developmental processes and developmental psychology. Well, how do we know what the proper time window is to link depression with alcohol use and alcohol with depression, right? Because that goes into design features, is do we really want just weekday, weekend, weekday, weekend? Do we want daily? Do we want hourly? Um, there's some wonderful examples of thinking about it of all of you when you get in the shower, you turn the hot water knob on, but hot water doesn't immediately come out. This is how I think about it sometimes, is you wait, and it's cold and then slowly it gets hot if you have a traditional water heater. I have two teenagers and we have one of those constantly circulating, which was the best thing I bought in my entire life. Right, but what's the lag to say, is the knob the cause of hot water? You take aspirin and your headache will begin to recede, but it takes time. We think about all of these things. You drink your coffee, I, it takes a little while for that caffeine to kick in. And it takes different times for different people, yep. right? The hot water is just the hot water, but if Dan and I, so Dan doesn't drink coffee, 
if we each took a shot of espresso at the same time, we are going to have a different window of when we would get a physiological response. Your eye is going to start to twitch super fast. Mm. And I may not even recognize it because I drink like a pot of coffee a day. So these are all wonderful problems to have, right? Because when Dan and I came up through the system, it was age six, age seven, age eight. And we could say with good faith of saying, well, I'm interested in uh, predicting change over time. And nobody would bat an eye. Well now, well, what kind of change? Between person, within person, lagged? you know, a latent change? Are you predicting change, predicting status, or change, predicting change? It's a good problem to have, but it's a problem to have. I mean, we have to deal with these yeah. things. So, Peter M., who has been kind enough to join us, I think, Yeah, Peter, we time. appreciate Where you, are you Peter? out in the world, Peter? Um, has a question about stationarity. Oh, and whether is... non-stationary is a problem. So a... you go so for it. So at the beginning, but... Patrick said we got time series analysis on one end and panel data analysis on the other, and ILD is in the middle. And time series analysis often makes this assumption of stationarity. And what that basically means is that the processes you're studying do not themselves change over time, right? So it's a stable process. And when we look at something like the effect of positive affect on alcohol use, it's not different on the 30th of the month than it was on the 14th of the month than it was on the 4th of the month, right? It's the same process, it's the same effect. Depending on the modeling framework you're using for ILD, you might or might not be making stationarity assumptions. So a typical DSEM model will assume stationarity, although there are ways to potentially relax that. In the multi-level model, we don't necessarily have to assume stationary. So we could have time trends. We don't have to have people fluctuating around a steady state. We could put a, a time trend on that. It could be curved. You could put be a baseline. freaking cosine right. in, in one application. It was a very different setting. But Dan, who actually does know math, unlike me, who I went into statistics because I don't know math, imposed a cosine function because there was this cyclical, and you do not have time to talk about the playing card in the, the bicycle. If you want to hear about a cosine function as a playing card in a bicycle tire, uh, no, no. <laughs> It's pretty cool. Imagine a bicycle going forward and the wheel is going around and you're following a mark on the wheel. That's... You just told me I know, story. I know. Score. Yeah. I got away with it. All right. So, with the model model, we don't necessarily have to assume stationary. We don't even necessarily have to assume that a predictor has the same effect over time. You could have an interaction between time and a, a within-person predictor. Yep. Uh, so maybe the effect of, of negative alcohol use or negative affect on alcohol use increases as you get closer to the end of the day or something like that. Um, so we can we can we don't have to have that stationarity assumption in the multi-level model, but some approaches analyzing ILD will bake that in, um, and so that is something to be thoughtful. Exactly. About. Yeah. And so it it. As Dan said, I like the term baked in, is sometimes it's a product of how it's programmed, how it's that's set up in the likelihood and the estimation, but it doesn't have to be. And back in the day, if you've ever heard the term detrending, is in time series, if you failed stationarity, that, yeah. that great efforts would be made to estimate some kind of trend and remove it and look at what's left over. Well, that's not horrible if you're only interested in the within person, but all of us in some way or another are interested in the between person, yeah. and that trend is really important, and I don't want to make it go away. Yeah, it's not a, for a lot of applications, it's not a nuisance for us, yeah. right? It's like, it's part of the key goal of the study is to see that time trend, and maybe how that time trend differs between periods, right? If you have like a pre-intervention where things yeah. are just bouncing around and then you bring the intervention in and, oh, you, you took them on a new path, you deflected that trajectory. Well, you don't want to subtract that away to meet some stationarity assumption, right? That's yeah. the phenomena of interest. And that's maybe a great ending point, which is even if you don't have these kinds of data now, knowing this method exists helps you plan future studies 
because I work with a buddy of mine who does an intervention in school based and he had three independent groups where he started measuring baseline in all of them. And then Cook and Campbell talked about this, Will Shadish talked about it. But in group one, they started the intervention in week six, in group two in week eight, and in group three in week 10. Mm. And so they're all humming along and group one starts going up at week six, group two starts going up at week eight, group three starts going up at week 10. And remember, we're building a case for the jury right? Where the, the case is, is we're bringing empirical data to bear on the evaluation of our theoretical drive hypotheses. The jury is our research audience. That is who we're trying to disseminate our work to. And if you only have one group and at week six they start going up, an alternative a, a hypothesis is, is that your, your treatment was effective. But there are alternative hypotheses. Maybe something happened there that had nothing to do with the treatment. That's a much harder argument to make if you show it again and just show it again. Mm -hmm. And so really the world's at your fingertips with this stuff in being able to use these to your advantage. Um, I think we should wrap up. We should wrap there. So remember we are not on next week. Yep. We're, we're too lazy and not dedicated just, enough. We, don't, we only live 10 minutes from campus and we're like, oh, it's spring uh, break. It's, it's spring uh, break. So, you know, <laughs> the idea of coming into a work But you know what? We are professional. It's professional development as well. And so if you're young and going into academia and, and get tenured, you can show up to work in t-shirts. Mine yeah. celebrates a cannibal. That's is, impressive. Mine is Alfred Packer Mountain Outfitting Company. And if any of you are from Colorado, you know Alfred Packer is a very famous cannibal. And they named the student union cafeteria is Alfred Packer Grill. They let the students pick. <laughs> And they named it after Alfred Packer and then only then figured out that he was the only convicted cannibal in Colorado. Wow. But our professional development tip that we'll end with is it's spring break. I don't feel it's, like coming It's work-life balance. <laughs> it really is, actually. So we will see you the following week on Tuesday. Tuesday. And we'll talk about type 1 error, type 2 error, and power. Right. Hey, take care, everybody. Thanks, Thank everyone. you for joining us, as always.